Lecture two, learning to think critically. Now, how do we reconcile the potential conflict between emotional experiences in everyday life, aesthetic experiences that we have, and finding some scientific experiments? How do we build that bridge? Now look, our, our goal of learning to think critically is not about being right or wrong. It's about figuring out the boundary conditions for each theory, for each idea that we have. When does it apply? When is it not? Because that opens the door for growth and development. Then we figure out how to bring different theories together in a unified structure, giving each one its appropriate due, reconciling its values, building some kind of intellectual unity. Our goal here, and in my book, is to understand processes in everyday life and also in an aesthetic context. We're looking at phenomena. What are phenomena? Well, phenomena are events that recur in worlds and people live in different worlds. When I want to learn about the arts, I'll visit a friend in a studio and understand the problems that he or she faces when they plan a project. We're going to show some lectures talking to them as well. We want to enter into people's worlds because this becomes a basis for developing insights. We want to go into the world so when we stand out of it, we're informed. So phenomena are events in their worlds that recur. And we learn to engage in acts of noticing because the discerning psychologist is the person who spots that little fragmentary moment that's so filled with meaning. In other words, we want to develop some interpretive skills. We want to understand situations, placing them in context, whether it's conflict, social relations, overuse of the internet, social isolation. We want to get into the worlds of people who are practicing it, being it, as a basis for developing our understanding. In other words, Meaning depends on the social context. Now, it's important to realize that this kind of natural history, this kind of descriptive process, which is what Darwin engaged in, or I'm just bringing it into the social world, precedes experimental science. We need to have a sense for the texture of worlds before we can begin to theorize about them in a causal way. Parts and wholes of worlds are the foundation for causal analyses. What's the guiding principle that helps me? Well, when I have a particular insight or phenomenon I'm interested in, I, I hold those examples out there in one hand, extend it. And when I interpose the, the lenses of theory and the lenses of method, they should bring that phenomenon into greater clarity, not distortion, so that you lose it. So what's a theory? Well, look, a theory is a kind of parsimonious, efficient, abstract account of some kind of process. It deals with causes and effects. We find relations among different levels of analysis. In the context of emotion, these are experienced phenomena, observed phenomena. And there are all these different ways which we can approach them listening to people, observing people, what's happening in the brain, what's happening chemically in the body, all these levels of analysis. And we also want to be sensitive to the history of the ideas and concepts that have been used to talk about emotion, to talk about the self. The truth value of a theory depends on the context in which it's formed and evaluated. And they're always replacing each other just as Einstein replaces Newton. The methods we use to explore these worlds, these phenomena in the world, to both develop and evaluate our theories are very, very important and potentially problematic. The goal in psychology is what we call ecological validity. Events in the lab should correspond to events that we observe in the world. The semiotician Paul Buissac says it's important to avoid what he calls the ontological trap. Now an ontological trap involves confusing a hypothetical notion 
a heuristic model, a semantic category that depends on a particular language, with an actual observable object in the world endowed with its own ontological presence and opacity. This scary kind of sentence really means the following. We have people in lived worlds, and when we engage in methodology, we should not imagine or delude ourselves that our measures are that world, because they're not. They're separate from, and we need to reflectively consider the extent to which what we do in the lab represents the world or takes us away from it. So we don't want to teach, treat concepts, teach them or treat them, concepts of the self, concepts of emotion, feelings, affects, aesthetic actions, as objects out there in the world. Because artists just do art, and people are just living their lives. And when we introduce psychological concepts to refer to those events in those worlds, we need to do it very carefully. We need to become aware of our words. Okay. Kurt Danziger, the historian of psychology, says, Methodology is not ontologically neutral because what we do in the lab, the data that we produce, are artifacts, byproducts of laboratory activities. They're not natural phenomena. The data that we collect in the lab, we want them to be ecologically valid and re represent those phenomena, but they are not the world outside. They're the world in the lab. And what we do in the lab and how we speak as academics and scholars are discursive categories. They're part of the language that we share in common in our world as scholars, which is different from the world of people in everyday life, be they artists or just couples interacting. Categories that we take for granted, for example, the category of emotion, are replete with unexamined and unquestioned assumptions and preconceptions. And this is a very, very serious issue because students take their lab courses and they take their classes and they do their multiple choice exams and they need to know those definitions, but they do it in an automatic way, in a rote way. And they sometimes forget that these words, these concepts are historically grounded. They are not the phenomena in the world. And when we think about this problem, phenomena, theory, and method as a constellation in our discipline of psychology, we have to realize that they, they take place in the profession. And the profession is a social system. Whether you're a student in a course, or a professor getting a job, or a researcher in a government context, you're in a social system that has gatekeepers. People who establish standards that ostensibly make sure the quality is preserved. But these are standards that let people in and keep people out. And the revolutionary-minded individual is not welcomed because that person threatens the status quo. And the reward structure of these professions reward us for replicating accepted paradigms and findings. And the more narrowly defined we are, Repeating what's been done before, the less we are open to change. The reward structure keeps people doing the same thing, whether they're scientists or artists. If you're paid for doing a particular kind of painting, you're not going to rush out and try something experimental and threaten your income. And, of course, all this occurs in a power structure, whether it's the art world or the academic research world, in both contexts, there's a power structure, and we need to situate ourselves within it. In other words, it's important to understand the relations between a profession as a social system, whether it's being a professional artist or a professional research psychologist, and the ideas, the phenomena that we're trying to study. There's a complicated relationship that is not sufficiently reflected upon in our daily practice. I want to give you an example of three very different ways of reflecting upon phenomena in the world in a British, a German, and a Chinese context. Now, going back to the Enlightenment in Britain in the 18th century, the concern was the contents of the mind and cognitive psychology and 
That domain is very much in the tradition of the British empiricists. They had a kind of naive realism. They believed that these objects were actually out there in the world and we perceive them accurately. They shape the mind, so we collect the little features and infer what's out there in the world. This relates to the kind of approach to truth from Moore and Russell in the early 1900s. A belief is true when there's a corresponding fact and false when there's no corresponding fact. But what's a fact? Are our measures facts? Are they true? Or are they just measures that we treat as if they were facts? So we can have a view of the world. It's real out there. We see it. We see it accurately. We make inferences about it. But that's just a viewpoint. It's not truth. The Germans, on the other hand, going back to Gottfried Leibniz, late 1600s, early 1700s, they established a different approach. They didn't emphasize the contents of the mind, they emphasized the acts of the mind, the kinds of things the mind is capable of doing when it interacts with the world. And this influenced Kant and influenced the romantics of the late 1700s and the early 1800s. For Kant, we can't see beyond our own frames of reference. Our goal is to search for patterns and processes underlying these experiences. We need to realize that in a certain sense, our concepts imprison us. We are trapped within our language. That's how we see the world. In the 20th century, Heidegger reintroduced the ancient Greek concept of aletheia, which relates to disclosure. We have truth on the one hand, for Moore and Russell, where a fact corresponds to something in the world that's truth, but in the more German tradition, we are looking for the presence of something. We are looking to remove the veil. We don't see ourselves as yet as having truth. It's a more holistic approach to knowledge. It's the idea that knowledge emerges. For my purpose, we study the world through science and the humanities to pull back the veils of nature and make the underlying processes intelligible for human beings. And this is where we turn to the Chinese, to the Taoist view. From a Taoist perspective, relations between concepts become clearer once we enter into them. According to Taoism, to understand the meaning or significance of a thing, one must become the thing. One must harmonize one's consciousness with it and reach the mental attitude which brings knowledge without intellectual deliberation. Whether we embed ourselves in a gang, whether we embed ourselves in a world of artists or filmmakers or people living in the streets, we understand their world. And by being in their world, we are shaped in our knowledge. In other words, by entering into phenomena, being at one with the phenomena, we embed ourselves in the direct experiences of them. So each of these views, the British, where we have a reality out there that we're trying to learn about, the German, in which we begin to reflect on the constraints of how our language and ideas traps us into seeing the world a certain way, and the Chinese who say, get out of yourself into the world, merge with the world. These are guiding ideas and principles behind my book. So the notion of complementarity is crucial here, because how can we reconcile opposing ideas in psychology? How can we rec reconcile opposing views about what art is and how it's created and what it means? Well, I'm learning from these guys. And I'm saying, look, separation is an illusion. Enter into their worlds, following the Chinese perspective. One phenomenon or idea is embedded in the other. The concepts are not as separate as we imagine. And so the goal in the end is to develop an overarching framework in which the different approaches to emotion theory, in which the different ideas about how aesthetics works and experience is shaped, they can each find a place. And so this is the purpose of my book, to reconcile opposing views about the self, 
ideas about emotions, feelings, and affects, ideas about relations between subject matter and style in the visual and literary arts. To do this, we need to adopt what Piaget called a kind of decentering. We need flexibility. We need to comfortably move up and down the staircase of the mind-body, to move up and down the staircase of these concepts from ab concrete experiences in the world to abstract ideas about how things work. In other words, we need to be able to shift between an engaged perspective in which the phenomena of interest are observed and experienced, a kind of bottom-up process, an inductive process, collecting facts as a basis for understanding the world, going upwards from individual cases to derive lessons or principles from them on the one hand, and on the other hand, a detached perspective in which the particularities disappear in favor of abstract processes, looking top down from abstract principles that can help predict individual events. In other words, we need to be able to move comfortably among these various ways of understanding the world and these various approaches to thinking in order to reconcile the humanities and science and different ideas within psychology and aesthetics. Thank you.